Sergeants, you can begin your recordings. Mr. Hope, Count, uh, Sergeant Hope, you ready? You may go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, good morning and welcome to the New York City Council Remote Hearing on Committee on Higher Education, jointly with the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. At this time, will all council members and council staff please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. I got my shake ready. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to today's virtual oversight hearing on child care services at City University of New York in the wake of COVID-19. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a proud CUNY alum. Thank you, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for joining us to hold this very important hearing. And before I get into today's topic, I just want to say that yes, we are still in the midst of this virus, this pandemic, and I want to urge everyone to take all necessary precautions. And as we're looking at CUNY as a tool for helping people to get through this COVID crisis and come out on the other side, I am again urging the Board of Trustees to not impose the additional fee, health and wellness fee on students at this time, they are already overburdened, and we are hoping that you will not vote to implement this fee, which you had decided that you would. But we're hoping that that vote will not go forward, nor the increases in any tuition. But to get to today's topic, at the committee's last joint hearing on childcare at CUNY, which was held at City College, following a tour of the then shuttered City College Child Development Center, we welcomed University Dean Sherry Cleary, who had recently taken on CUNY's campus child care centers in her portfolio. At that hearing, CUNY testified about plans to reopen City College's CUNY Development Center this fall, create a comprehensive directory of campus child care programs available at CUNY, create a centralized website for student parents to use as they determine their child care needs, to centralize marketing to enhance campus-based recruitment efforts to ensure that every student is aware of child care availability, to develop tools and more efficient use of real-time data to understand usage, operations, student retention, and graduation rates, in addition to other key factors and to consider expansion possibilities with a focus on infants and toddlers, as well as at campuses that lack childcare services. At the time, I was hopeful about these plans and the future of accessibility of accessible quality childcare for the CUNY student parents. Now I have concerns about the status of childcare as it is, and the university have been impacted by the pandemic at a time when parents and CUNY student parents in particular may have the greatest need. As a relatively affordable path to the middle class, CUNY has been a lifetime for New Yorkers looking to improve the quality of their lives for their families. It looks like I may have been knocked off. No, you're good. Okay, quality for their families. Uh, but in a city where childcare costs are estimated an average of $1,300 for infant care and $1,030 for a four-year-old, access to affordable quality childcare is one of the biggest hurdles student parents face when pursuing higher education. An August 2019 U.S. Government Accountability Office report found that more than one in five undergraduate students in the country were raising children and about half of the students left school without a degree. 
In 2015-2016, an estimated 55% of student parents were single parents. 44% were working full-time while enrolled and 64% attended school part-time. Yet, despite a dearth of time between parenting, completing coursework, and working for pay, student parents often have higher GPAs than students without children. They are also more likely to drop out as per the Institute for Women Policy Research. According to CUNY's 2016 Student Experience Survey, SES, the most recent SES available online, 12% of CUNY students, 11% at uh, senior colleges and 16% at community college were financially supporting children of which 49% reported having children under five years of age, 46% senior colleges and 54% community college. Yet only 6% of CUNY student parents utilize campus-based childcare. Meanwhile, 37% of CUNY students' parents pay for off-campus childcare. Note that this issue primarily impacts women of color at CUNY. 71% of CUNY student parents are women and 51% are students of color. Last March, COVID forced CUNY to transition to a distance learning model, which was a huge feat accomplished through sheer determination. As it will be expected with such a large undertaking, undertaking there were hiccups along the way. But we have come out of the other end and now we need to understand what the quote new normal is in light of the pandemic. And now more than ever, we need to hold fast to the university's mission to be quote, of vital importance as a vehicle for the upward mobility of the disadvantaged in the city of New York, end quote. In addition to gaining a better understanding of the university's plan to support student parents at this time, while many have lost their jobs and many may be otherwise struggling, I am particularly interested in the status of the CUNY Family Empowerment Community College Program, a pilot initiative to support student parents for which CUNY's Borough of Manhattan Community College, Bronx Community College, Hostos Community College, and LaGuardia Community College received a total of $2 million over three years to serve approximately 160 student parents. In my capacity as the chair of the Council's Committee on Higher Education, I am committed to demanding real investment in the city's black and brown communities, which includes investment in CUNY. This includes fighting for a tuition-free CUNY, as well as supportive programs that lead to degree attainment, which is an investment in the city's economy. Indeed, New York is one of the most culturally diverse cities in the country and along with many of its great institutions, such as CUNY, New York is the greatest city in the world, not in spite of its diversity, but because of it. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the work done by my chief of staff, Joy Simmons, uh, Indigo Washington, my director of legislation and CUNY liaison, Chloe Rivera, the committee's senior policy analyst, Paul Senegal, counsel to the committee, and Monica Peregrine, the committee's finance analyst. And at this time, I would like to have, I will turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for her opening statement. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you, Chair Barron. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I wanna thank Speaker Johnson and Chair Barron for uh, Chair Barron of the Committee on Higher Education for working uh, with us on this important hearing. The lack of affordable quality childcare in this country has had a historically profound uh, impact on women, both socially and economically. We know from research and lived experience that childcare responsibilities fall overwhelmingly on women but parents are deeply impacted by, um, sorry, let me start again, but all parents are deeply impacted by the availability of childcare, which determines whether they can work outside the home 
go to school, et cetera. I know it was the case for my mom, and I'm sure everyone's thinking of someone they know right now who was in the same situation. It's important to note that the average annual cost, as Chair Barron noted, of infant care in New York is over 15,000 annually, nearly 1,300 monthly, making it simply unavailable to many families. Childcare is a fundamental need, and the current crisis ha has exposed the inequities and weaknesses throughout our childcare system. Many of the community-based childcare centers, which were closed during the pandemic, are minority and women-owned businesses. Both the loss of these childcare centers and overall school closures forced the city to launch its own childcare centers for essential workers. For the purposes of this hearing, we are here today to investigate the lack of childcare at CUNY knowing that the lack of childcare is one of the main barriers that women with young children face in accessing higher education and the workforce, exacerbating gender-based economic inequality and inequity. As mentioned at our last hearing on this topic, studies show that people with a bachelor's degree earn 68% more and are half as likely to be unemployed than those with a high school degree. And these economic impacts have been intensified by, co by the COVID-19 crisis. Addressing childcare at CUNY is incredibly important on its own. And this is why we are holding a third hearing on the topic during this session. But CUNY is also a microcosm for the city. Striving to get childcare right for CUNY students helps us get it right for everyone. Indeed, our examination of demand, safety, and communication-related issues within CUNY's child care system may provide insight as the city prepares to significantly expand child care services this fall. From very movie tes moving testimony provided at past hearings, we know that CUNY student parents have had to make the difficult decision to leave school because they were unaware of or unable to access CUNY's childcare program. We are here today to understand why. Is there a lack of communication with students regarding the availability of childcare because of the limited number of slots? Our central goal is to better understand how we can support student parents. From what we can see, the demand for childcare clearly exists as very well documented by Chair Barron. We acknowledge that even with shortcomings, the city's Department of Education has stepped up to provide childcare and open a discussion on this vital resource. We commend the DOE on opening the rec centers and for their work on the Learning Bridges program. Though again, it's unclear to us how the city is measuring need when only 100,000 students will receive free childcare via Learning Bridges, yet we have a student population of over a million. We thank CUNY for your time, as always, knowing that there is so much more work to do, and a special thank you to the many people who are gonna be testifying today we know how busy you all are, especially as the demand for childcare continues to grow. I'd also like to thank my chief of staff, Marisa Mock, my legislative director, Madhuri Shukla, my communications director, Sarah Crean, as well as the committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney, our counsel, Chloe Rivera, senior legislative policy analyst, Monica Peppel, finance analyst, and Elizabeth Arts, who represents community engagement. I would like to acknowledge the um, members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity who have joined us today. I see Council Member Ayala, Council Member Kalos, and Council Member Lander. Thank you. I turn it back to Council Member Barron. Uh Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, Chair Rosenthal. 
And I will now turn it over to the committee counsel, Paul Senegal, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearings and administer the oath to the panels. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. I'm Paul Senegal. I'm counsel to the Committee on Higher Education of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council members' questions will be limited to five minutes. Council members, please note that this includes both your question and the witness's answer. Please also note that we will only allow one round of questions at today's hearing. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You will be called on after everyone on that panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to five minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following member of the administration uh, to testify. Sherry Cleary, University Dean of Early Childhood Initiatives. And I just want to note that, Ms., that Dean Cleary will be accompanied by Keisha Fuentes, who is the University Manager of Child Care and Leadership Programs. Uh, Ms. Fuentes will be available for questions um, after Dean Cleary finishes her testimony. I will now deliver the oath to both of you. And after, I will call upon each of you individually to respond to the oath. Dean Cleary, uh, Ms. Fuentes, uh, would you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Okay. Dean Cleary? I do. Ms. Fuentes? I do. Thank you very much. Uh, Dean Cleary, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Account Chair Chairwoman Barron and Chairwoman Rosenthal and members from the Committees of Higher Education and Women and Gender, I have to say I so appreciate your opening comments. Thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you today. I'm joined by Keisha Fuentes, my colleague in this work. I'm Sherry Cleary, University Dean of Early Childhood Initiatives, and I have the honor of working with CUNY's 17 campus child care centers. I also lead the work of the New York Early Childhood Professional Institute. I co-chair the Governor's Early Childhood Advisory Council. And, um, I oversee the Family Empowerment Project and I chair the CUNY's newly formed Student Parent Task Force. Um, I assure you that we have made progress in every one of the components of my previous testimony. Uh, in the past year, I'm also going to share with you that my office has created the CUNY Early Childhood Work Workforce Scholarship, which has provided career and college advisement and scholarships in support of career mobility to individuals working in the city's early childhood programs. Of the 100 first-time recipients of this scholarship, 99 completed their uh, studies last semester in spite of the pandemic. Of the 99 indiv individuals who completed, 91% were women, 87% were of color, 72% uh, were over the age of 30, and 96% earned grades ranging from A plus to B. Today, I'm here to give you a report on the campus child care centers. As is the case with every entity across the city, state, and country, the campus child care centers have been deeply affected. At the same time, each of the programs has risen to the occasion and has fulfilled their mission of serving children um, of, of campus student parents with great care and attention to detail while maintaining teaching relationships with each and every child. You will see in the first chart that I attached to my testimony that the child care centers enrolled 18% more children in the spring 2020 semester. As the pandemic became a reality, 
these children were served at home using a range of remote learning platforms. Select centers stayed open to provide childcare for essential employees across the city. During the past six months, the campus child care centers used the funds provided them by the state and the city council to keep all program staff employed as they conducted regular family wellness uh, calls and continued to engage children uh, through virtual uh, means and through the US mail and by telephone. It was immediately clear in late March that our CUNY families were sustaining significant illness and unthinkable loss. Our student parents were caught between worrying about their elderly family members, their young children, and their studies. The staff of the campus child care centers called upon their family support skills and began making regular wellness checks with our student parents, providing support and referrals to manage health housing, financial, and academic stressors. Mitigating food insecurity was a regular topic. Balancing the needs of their young children with the needs of their school-aged children while trying to maintain an online presence with their college classes and professors entailed a new kind of time and attention management. The Chancellor's Emergency Relief Fund prioritized students with dependents when making grant awards in late spring and early summer. My office raised an additional $45,000 of, of private money to add to the Chancellor's Emergency Relief Fund to send an additional set of funds to 99 student parents experiencing continued financial hardship in late summer. Distance learning for young children is not ideal, and yet, the teachers at the CUNY campus child care centers demonstrated a creativity and a resourcefulness that has been used as a model elsewhere in the state. Teachers found ways to interact with children individually and in small groups, reinforcing their already established relationships, creating videos, reading familiar and new stories, including a book that encourages parents to participate in the census while providing children with math and cultural lessons, singing songs, dancing and exercising, and learning the type of foundational skills that will serve these children forever. Centers have expanded their services to CUNY student parents, school-age children, providing tutoring and class support and social engagement on a remote basis in an effort to further support student parents with children that span both early and elementary ages. The directors and I have been meeting weekly since the shutdown to monitor their needs and to develop guidance to reopen programs in anticipation of the DOHMH closure order being lifted. Uh, you have the guidance for reopening document that was developed by my office and sent to each campus president in support of their deliberations about reopening individual colleges. Phase recommendations for campuses that are opening for the fall include making all essential arrangements, uh, including guidelines for disinfecting, cleaning, providing appropriate PPE, creating policies and practices to minimize risk, limiting enrollment and attendance, managing drop off and pickup, and much more. I'd like to share a short video made by one of our programs, the Child Development Center at Brock's Community College, if I may as they welcome back 25% of their enrollment in in-person learning. So Paul, is it possible to show that video? The video will be played shortly. Thank you. So we need the sound. Well, 
while we're waiting, I'll tell you that this video was made to help parents get ready for rejoining the program uh, in a face-to-face -face format. And then it was uh, shared with all the other programs and it's been shared across the state as an example of how to support families in making the transition back to a face-to-face -face, uh, format, which most families are very, very nervous about, understandably. Welcome to the BCC Early Childhood Center. We're opened and ready to welcome you and your child back. We've developed this video to help prepare you with some of the new procedures that we've implemented to ensure the health and safety of you and your child. First, you will be asked to fill out a survey the night before you drop your child off. Once you have completed the survey, your name will be added to an approved list of individuals to be allowed on campus. It is very important to ensure you fill this survey out in a timely manner as public safety will have the right to turn you away. Masks are required for all adults and children over the age of two while on campus. Once you have been cleared by public safety, you will make your way to the Early Childhood Center. Once you've reached the center, your child's temperature will be taken. Once your child has had their temperature taken and has been cleared, the staff member will then take the child, wave goodbye to you, and escort them to the lobby where they will sanitize their hands. Please note, that DOH regulations state that any child's temperature that reads over 100 degrees will not be allowed to drop off. When the child has finished sanitizing their hands, they will then be escorted to their designated classroom by another staff member. Upon entering the classroom, they will be greeted by their teacher who will ask them to wash their hands again as a secondary precautionary measure. Your child's school day will seem pretty much normal. They'll be interacting with other classmates and teachers on a daily basis. The teachers will try their best to teach the child about physical distancing, but will still give them hugs whenever they need it. Thank you so much. I think this represents the real diligent precautions that each center is taking to keep children and staff safe and to engender trust and peace of mind for, for parents to come back to campuses whenever possible. Each campus has made their own decision about whether to reopen for children to physically attend the center. Some of these decisions have been made based on the level of infection the community experienced during the height of the pandemic. 
other factors in the decision making process involve the type of campus environment. For example, vertical campuses that rely heavily on elevators to, to move students and faculty through the buildings. These plans change as campus leadership continues to monitor risk and the availability of support staff to manage the facilities and security needs as well as program function. City College suffered construction delays throughout the pandemic. I've met with both the new director and campus administration over the past several months, monitoring their progress and supporting their efforts to mitigate the additional challenges they've faced with construction, difficulty in receiving deliveries, permit and license inspection delays, and decisions affecting the entire campus reopening. Based on the limited student pres presence on campus this fall, I supported their decision to open the program in January, providing that CUNY is able to provide is able to move to a more robust in-person campus presence. The director continues to prepare the program for opening and is managing a waiting list of City College students, faculty, and staff who patiently manage their own COVID-19 circumstances. Centers that are opening are doing so abiding by the, the guidance document beginning with no more than 25% of their enrollment in person. All other children are receiving daily engagement from their classroom teachers using virtual platforms. Most of the time, the engagement is synchronous. Some of the programs have added virtual storytelling features and other activities that parents can use other times while they are attending one of their virtual college courses. Campuses that also manage pre-K contracts from the city and directly from the state are in compliance with the requirements of those contracts and in alignment with family choice, maintaining daily engagement with children in person and virtually. As the semester proceeds and we continue to monitor prog program success and challenges, we will remain hyper -vig vigilant to manage risk while providing a range of supports to families and their young and school age children. We remain optimistic in our belief that there will be a vaccine in the future and that we will be able to build enrollment across the year to accommodate as many student, parent, children as possible. Uh, I wanna thank you and I'm truly happy and ready to answer all of your questions. Um, thank you. We will now turn to Chair Barron for questions. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank you for your testimony and for including that video, uh, getting it done and really having an opportunity for us to see what it is in action. And I, before I forget, want to acknowledge the behind the scenes staff that's working so diligently on juggling all of this. I want to acknowledge all of that. Before I go further, I do want to acknowledge that we did have higher education committee members as a part of the panel, council member Maisel, and Council Member Rodriguez are both on this or they were here. We want to acknowledge their participation. Um, I've got lots of questions before I turn them over to my chair, uh, Rosenthal, who's sharing with me today. And I'll try to be succinct because I want to allow the members to pose their questions as well. First of all, what is the status of the Child Care Center at City College? So the status of the City College uh, Child Care Center is that it is nearly complete in its construction. It is working with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to secure its final inspections. Those two pieces, both construction and inspections, have been delayed. Um, most of the inspectors are, are also working remotely, and so everything has been delayed. Um, but the center it, the last time I was there, which was uh, across the summer, is looking very beautiful. And uh, items have been unpacked and things have been put in their place. There is a robust waiting list. And, uh, and when the program is able to open, it will open, I, I would hope, with a full enrollment, unless, of course, the pandemic uh, perseveres and then it will open in the same way that we've guided the other programs to open in phases, starting with 25%, adding another 25% after that, and, and so on. Um, I think that in, in truth, 
because there are almost no students on campus and only students who are participating in required labs and, um, are being are on campus, it made the most sense, especially since the licenses are not secured yet to wait until the uh, spring semester when most of CUNY is anticipated to to move into another phase. Okay, and let, course, me pose a more sure. let me pose a more direct question. What is sure. your target date for opening? And how My can target. I need assistance yeah. in helping you getting the documentation or the uh, permissions that you need? Because I'm very, very displeased. I understand the pandemic came, mm -hmm. this, but this is unacceptable that it's taken five years for a program that was supposed to have been a project to have been completed in one year. So what now is your target date to open? So I can speak for myself. I, 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 my target date is that the program would open at the very least for 25% of its enrollment in, as the January semester begins, as the, as the spring semester begins. I don't want to say spring because that does imply much later than January. So all campuses reopen after this after the winter break uh, in late January and our target date is the is, the, is at that point. Um, okay. Everything should be done and I want to say that I truly welcome your offer of help and that, if we need to I will take it, you up on it. I, I, re I really appreciate that it's very heartfelt and sincere and I want to do whatever I can to help assist in that. Uh, Thank you. Secondly, the comprehensive directory that we discussed at our last hearing, yeah. what is the status of that directory? Comprehensive sure. directory of child care programs at CUNY. Yes. So um, it is complete and it is just, so the, the framework of it has been completed and we continue to put more and more information into it, but its framework is complete. Uh, some of the funding that you provided uh, to us has afforded us the opportunity to, I, to hire an extraordinary uh, data manager who has created this framework for us. And we just now continue to populate it, but it is, it is complete. And uh, along those lines, we now have access to real-time information. Uh, he has essentially trained each of the directors how to use that database. And so as new information becomes available, it gets inputted. Uh, the pandemic has forced us to think about recording information slightly differently so that we have real-time data this fall to determine how many children are physically on site and how many children are being remotely served and in what ways they're being remotely served. So we've expanded the use of this directory for, uh, for Keisha and I to monitor progress uh, in how the programs also are managing the pandemic. So, so we've, what, we've what expanded is, its value. What is the purpose, the audience, the accessibility of this directory? Is it just for, I heard you talk about directors. Is this going to be accessible in some form to the students that are on campus? Is it a part of a website? How yes. do they know it exists? And what is the intent of that uh, directory? Sure. So we are in the process of building the website that I referred to back in the fall or winter uh, when I last gave testimony. Clearly that effort has taken a slight back burner, but that doesn't mean we stopped working on it. We just slowed our work to really spend more time focusing on the pandemic, but the website is in development. And, and as that website is launched, it'll have air, all the, the basic directory information on it. Students will be able to uh, use it to consult, um, to, to figure out where they might wanna be. Uh, as I understand it, a request of the city council uh, a few years back in influenced and inspired a, a change in our policy, which is that a student who attends a campus that doesn't have campus childcare can now attend a, an existing campus childcare center on a different campus. And this directory and website will facilitate those matches much better. 
And uh, at the onset of the pandemic, when we decided to be open for emergency uh, workers, essential workers, we formed, we created a centralized site, website and contact number. And that, um, that was a great test case for what we intend to do going forward, which is to have a centralized way for student parents to find childcare. And so we also uh, alluded to that in, in my previous testimony and tested that with the pandemic. It was most effective, it worked. And so we will continue to work in this vein so that when student parents find that they need childcare, they have a centralized place to go. They surely can do what they used to do, which is go to a campus childcare center physically and apply, but they'll also have a centralized place where we can track and monitor that. Okay, so the directory information will be used for the website so that students mm -hmm. know what's available. Now you said you tested it during the pandemic. How did you test it and what, how did that manifest itself and what did you find? So what we did in the pandemic, so during the pandemic, we kept two programs open first with the plan to open others if there was enough demand. There was not enough demand. And this was also experienced by the DOE when they set up their childcare, they set up much more childcare than there was actually a demand for. So, but, but having said that, what we did was we created a website and a, and a centralized phone number and an email address where people could go if they needed care. For the, for the um, uh, essential workers, what we did was we created a flyer and we circulated that far and wide amongst hospitals and other essential workplaces. And then as people just needed childcare, they could contact that email or phone number and then they received a call immediately back. If if the if the somebody if and Keisha monitored this, if uh, Keisha was on the phone, she could call them immediately back. If they left a message, if they emailed her, she contacted them immediately, and found and and did an intake of what they needed, how old their children were, where they worked, where they lived, where their geographic preference was. Uh, we purposely kept a program open in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, and in the Bronx to try to get some geographical span. And then as people uh, asked, told us what they needed, she made references. And I and would only was, add that was, we not only, we not only suggested that they use one of our two programs, but if that didn't work, we made other uh, referrals to them to try to help them find a place that met their needs. What were the locations of the two uh, uh, sites that you used sure. and how many students were enrolled? How many children, Le I'm sorry, were enrolled? Yep. Lehman and BMCC. And after about six weeks, we closed BMCC because there was no interest uh, from essential workers to use uh, Lower Manhattan. And Lehman stayed open across the summer, but uh, spring and summer, but very, very few children. I think at any one time, they probably served between five and eight children. If, so there were very few children, uh, families who took, who took advantage of this availability. I find that uh, interesting. I would, I would have thought that there was a greater need than just five or eight. Yes. And was it limited to just the essential workers or did you do an outreach then since you did have a center to try to get others involved? Uh, we did outreach and the governor's office did outreach. The governor's office asked for the flyer and, and sent the flyer to as many, uh, we, we gave them full, you know, we said, send it to whomever you think in the city will need our, our services. And, um, and, and that's just what happened. So we were open, we, wait, we worked, we manned this uh, phone and email account every single day. And there were, there were probably, you know, there were several people that, that inquired, but what they needed, um, you know, they, the they were able to find other what places. Hours that it was available 
the service hours. Maybe that was question. It. So the, the, they, the, each program was open for five days a week, full, full days. So eight to six okay. on any, on any given day. All right. So that leads me to my next question, uh, which is, we had talked about it in our last uh, hearing, centralized marketing to mm -hmm. enhance the uh, campus-based centers availability, knowing that if they were there and be recruiting, because I think that there's a, there's, a mis there's a disconnect someplace. So that comment about only five to eight during the summer leads directly to the next question. How are we going to make sure that the marketing that we are doing uh, for the uh, knowledge to get out that these child care centers exist. What are we going to do to market it? Well, we, so once we finish this website, we'll have a centralized website that will have this directory on it. We'll provide people with guidance, simple guidance of how to identify their need. And then we'll be able to centrally monitor what people need and where they need it and, and how they need it. It'll also have um, an additional effect because as we understand what student parents need, we'll be able to support our programs to add infant care, to add additional hours. As you probably remember, some of our programs have very extensive hours and days of services. You know, I always use BMCC as an example. They're open during regular uh, life, they're open seven days a week and five nights a week. Um, so we, we want to monitor what is it that student parents need. I would also add that we've established a student parent task force that is CUNY wide to begin to uh, really study and understand what are all the needs of student parents. This will, this task force charge exceeds or extends past early childhood and childcare. But of course, there will be a, a significant focus on early childhood and, and childcare. Uh, but we'll also extend it to really better understand and help campuses understand what are all the opportunities to meet the needs and support the success of student parents. Uh, in your testimony, you surely acknowledge that our student parents are some of our best students. They're some of our most motivated students and we want to consider all the ways that we can support them. So in, ter in terms of the marketing that we're talking about to let students know, mm -hmm. will you do, how will you gather the information to determine where the greatest need is, whether it's for UPK, UK3 or child, early child, how will you know mm -hmm. where the need is so that you can determine how you will set it up at the different campuses. And is so it one of, to each campus? So one of the pieces of work we did over the summer was to meet with uh, central office data people um, and to try to determine what is the best way as soon as a student becomes affiliated with the City University of New York to determine whether they are a student parent what their goals are and how old their children are. And, and so we can be, we can contact them. And in other words, we're gonna not wait till they contract us. We will contact them to say, welcome to CUNY. We understand that you're a parent as well. And we'd like to understand what your goals are at CUNY and what your needs are. And so what, by, what is that document that will capture that information? Is We're it a in the, student application to CUNY or is it a separate document or do they have to log into their student account? What is that document that will capture that information so that you can help determine the level uh, of childcare services in terms of the types of programs? So one of the things that we've acknowledged in the, in the course of these meetings is that CUNY students come to us in many different ways. So right. one form is to use their FAFSA form, but it's not, it's not adequate enough because not everybody files a FAFSA form and not everybody, so, so we worry that we wouldn't catch everybody that way. So we will use the FAFSA form to first determine who has dependents. Um, and then we're working right this moment on 
Is there a question on the application that we would add? Is there a, you know, what are the other ways? We've met with some of our uh, central office partners that run our um, programs where students come in maybe at a, um, you know, at a, at a job training level and how can we access their needs and support and provide support. So we're working with different parts of the central office to make sure that we're maximizing our ability to identify all, as many student parents as we can. Um, and when do you anticipate that you will have that document or that uh, question on the application or question on the outreach uh, entry forms that children that students will be completing? When do you anticipate that will be ready so that we know every student entering CUNY or already in CUNY, that's another question, not just those that are entering, but those that are already in, how do we do that? Right. So when will you have this comprehensive ability to let students know all of the grant programs that CUNY has? So we will work on building our capacity this year, this academic year started last week, two weeks ago. We're working on that now. We have another meeting next week. We'll begin to figure out where are the gaps in what we're able to collect and start building, um, start building uh, strategies that way. Um, we will think about how we integrate ourselves in new student orientation. I think there are a lot of different ways for us to build this capacity. I would expect that within this calendar year, I'm sorry, within this academic year, we would have all of our strategies in place. It takes a bit to get something into the new application, new student application. To your point, we need to collect data for, on existing students. Um, yes. And so we have to figure out what that looks like and how we go about that. Um, so it's, not, you ask a great question. We're working on it. Okay. Not to be insensitive to all of the needs and the pressing demands and the urgency that we're facing. If we could work double time <laughs> or double up our efforts and get it for January, along with that City College Child Development Center open, that would be really great. And again, if I can be of any assistance, please let me know. I'm available to put in some ideas and some hours and I have staff that I can assist with, that I can have assist with. So I really think that it's critical that we open these opportunities for students so that they can get into uh, having themselves complete their education because they know they have childcare. And lastly, before I turn to my colleague, Helen Rosendahl, how can we expand what we are already doing? How can we increase the numbers? Because that was one of the questions that we asked from the previous hearing. How can we expand that? What can be done? So we've increased enrollment in the, in, the, in the spring semester, and we think that we can increase enrollment even still um, by centralizing our work a bit more. And um, we've written a proposal still pending, we should know something mid-October or no later than the end of October. We've written a proposal to, um, to, to actually deepen and strengthen the work that some of our programs do. And uh, part of that proposal was to determine whether we could add more infant and toddler care. We acknowledge that is a, it's very important to me that we expand not only in number, but in the age ranges of children that we serve. We know that if student parents could start back to, back to school earlier uh, with, with younger children, they probably would have a better chance of succeeding and of course finishing, um, which is for everybody the goal. Uh, and so we've just, as I said, written a proposal um, for private money to, uh, to build out some of this work with the goal, if we're successful in a be, being granted the money and, and doing what we promised to then expand out after the first, team, first 18 months of this project to include even more campuses. So we're right. gonna start targeting three campuses and, the, and then okay. expand out. And yeah. so while we are incredibly indebted to you 
uh, the city council for your support, we're also interested in, in finding some private money to help us make a greater expansion quicker. And yeah. um, so, so that's what I'll say is that we know it's both about centralizing our work to increase enrollment, but also to look at how can we serve a, a wider age range of children to go down into the infant program. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate it. And at this time, I will turn it over to my co-chair, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Thank you. I have lots more questions, but I want to share the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. I really appreciate that. And you already hit on some of the most important questions and cleared up a lot of the questions that we had been having going into this hearing. So I really appreciate you I'm for glad. that. Um, Dean Cleary, I, I really just have two questions or two areas of questions that I wanna focus on. One is sort of trying to get a better handle on whether or not we're meeting the demand um, for childcare. And secondly, around uh, the funding. So I'd like to start with the demand. Um, and uh, Chair Barron laid it out in her testimony where she gave the data from CUNY's 2016 SES, um, which was the most recently available. Uh, I guess my first question is when will the 2018 or the more recent uh, survey be available? So that's a great question. I don't. Uh, I'll have to find out. Um, I think I'm just too new to know, but that's no real excuse. I'll find out. Um, do you know so, if uh, what I that's oh. right? Do you know if an SES has been done since the 2016 one? Uh, I don't, but I'll find out. I'm sorry. Um, but I would also say that if there's any question about whether we're meeting the need, the simple answer is absolutely not. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's more thank need. you. <laughs> thank you for acknowledging that. Um, I mean, just doing simple math from the 2016 survey, mm -hmm. you know, if the total number of students is roughly 275,000 and 12% need childcare, that uh, means about 33,000 um, need childcare. And, you know, roughly 1,700, maybe more, use the on site CUNY services. Again, using the statistics from that Chair Barron shared, about 12,000 pay for off campus care. Uh, so that totals up to roughly 14,000 students and what is going on with the remaining 19,000 students? You know, how many are dropping out because they don't have childcare at all? Um, you know, fundamentally meeting the needs of 17, 1800 students when you have 33,000 who are parents, um, you know, should give all of us pause. Yes, there's no question. And of course, uh, pre-K, the establishment of pre-K has put a, has affected all childcare across the city. Um, it has, it has destabilized childcare across the city. I'm proud to say that the campus childcare centers have figured out how to incorporate pre-K into the programs that they have. So they've uh, not suffered the loss of enrollment um, that others have, but I think we know for sure that there is a greater need, whether it's, you know, I'm sure it's not 33,000, but we know that it's easily a lot more than we currently serve. And the so question, I'm a little confused you know, by sure. what you just said. I mean, I, sure. you, you're sort of flipping an idea. You're saying that other child care centers have been destabilized. In other words, they're losing children yes. to the now free and available universal pre-K. But it would strike me, particularly given what you just said, that we know there's more demand out there, 
that in fact CUNY should let those kids go to the free UPK and use its use all of its spots for the people who need something different than free UPK. Like I don't even understand the thinking I can of yeah. So here's what is it's really important to be mindful of is that for th services for three and four year olds in childcare help make childcare fi financially viable. And so a program, no matter how well it's funded and no program is funded well enough to serve only children from birth to age three, there, there, there is no program in the country that is funded well enough unless it has extraordinary private resources to serve only children from birth to three. Childcare locally, statewide, and nationally requires a balanced enrollment of, of all the ages. And three and four-year-old children who require, a, a, who have a higher ratio of teacher to child, stabilize the, finance, the financial stability of, a, of an early childhood program. The, and further, what the campus child care centers have done is responded to the DOE's request that they also serve pre-K children because the city was, has been looking always for high quality settings for it to put pre-K in. And so there are some- But does that mean that the university is paying for that UPK? In other words, no, no, taking that on that funded. burden, or is that funded by the DOE? Funded by the DOE and strengthening the financial models, in many cases, of the centers themselves. So you have, you have programs I mean, that... you have to sort of weigh what you're saying here. You're saying that you got money to take care of a segment of the population. But what you're not acknowledging is you're taking those spaces and therefore they're not available to kids who are other ages. And basically what you're saying is because the CUNY system doesn't have the money to adequately fund childcare, you had to give up spaces that could be serving zero to three by taking the money from DOE to finance your childcare centers. Another I way of thinking, I, and I understand finances drive so much. I really do, more than you probably know. In much decision-making is based on the finances that are available. That doesn't mean it's good decision-making it just means that you need money. But fundamentally, what could have happened is CUNY campuses could have said to their parents, use the free UPK that the city is offering, perhaps at a uh, elementary school near you, at a childcare site near you. I've got Mm -hmm. plenty in my district, use that. And if the money were available, which it's not, then CUNY would have had more spaces for the people who need childcare for zero to three. So I guess what I'm suggesting is of the 33,000 children that we acknowledge that CUNY has, many of them are already using their community-based pre-K. Yes, we so know that 14,000 are, or 13,000. Right. No, I mean, I'm just doing the math off of your 2016 yes. SES. So, so 13,000 are using their community. That right. means that 19,000 need somewhere to go. Right. So. Parents choose different things. Some of them choose to use campus childcare, and we acknowledge that we need many more spaces for more student parents to use our programs. Right, and what There's I'm no saying question. is that because CUNY made the decision 
to take the money from DOE mm -hmm. in order to subsidize the cost, you actually, CUNY actually lost spaces that could have been made available by the city's generous offering, <laughs> brilliant offering, no question, of universal pre-K. Right. What you've done fundamentally because the, because CUNY is not prioritizing childcare is they are taking city money to take away spaces that could have been freed up if you had the money for zero to three. And so if what you're taking, I mean, I guess I'd be curious to know of the 1750 childcare slots, how many are UPK? I can get that number for you. But, but I, that tells us, I mean, let's assume sure. it's half. I mean, yeah, is it a quarter? Not. No. Quarter? 10%? Uh, if it's 10%, would... that's 175 kids. Mm -hmm. 175 student parents. Mm -hmm who can't send their kids to CUNY because you don't have space. So let me assure you that the majority of the children that are three and four, and especially, especially four that are, that are being partially funded by a, a, a pre-K spot, the majority of them are CUNY children whose parents want them to be on campus with them. And I, and I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I, ju okay. I just, I mean, we'll I think that we're trying to really meet the needs of what parents are telling us they want. And, and it is not a good idea from a child development standpoint to have a child be somewhere for a year or two and then move for a year or two and then yet another move. So the consistent- uh, Of course, of course, right? I'm all for and stability. You, right. But so, um, I'm, just, I'm just saying right. that- uh, I and I do it. want to link this to the second point, which has to do with cost. And what I'm struck by is in your testimony, you said that you were able to raise $45,000 for 99 kids to get childcare. No, no, to get, no, sorry. We raised some money to add to the Chancellor's Emergency Relief Fund to just provide parents of our highest need families to provide them with some financial support, nothing, not childcare, just so, let me just talk for a minute about the emergency relief fund that the chancellor created. Early on, there was private funding and public funding combined to support students at the City University of New York that were in desperate need of financial support and assistance. And that those monies were distributed in late spring across all of our 25 campuses for students that were determined to have financial need. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was something to kind of give them a little bit of support. When we realized that we too could perhaps do more of that, we raised uh, we were able to apply for a $45,000 grant. I did that. And we then identified 99 families that currently attend our programs who were experiencing, as I said, greater financial need. It was simply an effort just to help people get through the, the summer and early fall. And it was not, it was not, it was just financial support. It had nothing to do with childcare. It was, it was just- Oh, given... so you don't even know if it went to help with childcare? Well, most of our family, no, no, it, it was as parents wanted to use it. It was, it was- Sure. It could be for parents... food. It could be yes. for rent. Gotcha. No, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sim simply that. All right. I, I'm done for this moment. I'm going to turn it back to Chair Barron. Um, I may want a second round, but I'm going to turn it back to you. I don't see any questions from our colleagues. So I'll turn it back to you, Chair Barron. Thank you. 
Uh, I will turn it to the council. Do we have colleagues that have questions that they want to raise? Yes, if any council members have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing none, uh, we'll turn it back to Chair Barron. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, I wanna follow up on the question that my colleague just asked. In terms of the assistance that you gave to those 99 uh, students, what was the average cost? Was there one, what was the criteria for determining uh, who would be eligible? And what was the average award that each of them received? So there was no average. Each of them got $500. OK. They each got $500. And the criteria, we worked with each of the directors given that they had uh, regular weekly contact with families and understood the issues and challenges that families were receiving to prioritize a list of families that they felt needed support the most. It was not a scientific criteria. It was weekly interaction, feedback, uh, checking in with families every week, finding out where their stressors were and that, so again, not exactly the a scientific approach, but as most, as personal as we could keep it. And we created a confidential list and then sent it through to, for these disbursements. Okay, thank you. In terms of the setup at the child development centers, the video showed that there was a uh, clear barrier between children that would be positioned at either end of the desk. Is that something that we would see at every child development center? It's, a, it's interesting that you ask. Each program was guided to take as many different precautions as they could. And so my uh, best answer would be most of them are using that strategy some of them may have found other strategies that they felt made, uh, made a better accommodation. Um, you'll notice that in the video, they didn't talk about social distancing, they talked about physical distancing. And, um, and, and so I think that, and, and the other thing that I'd point out is that in the course of the video, they say, if your child needs a hug, they will get a hug. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the kind of challenge that everybody would acknowledge we're experiencing across this city and state and country is do we touch people? Do we not touch people? And you can't not touch little children. Uh, children will need help in the bathroom. They will need help, you know, eating their lunches. We have all these strategies about, uh, we no longer now do what is normally acceptable behavior and, and actually encourage behavior, which is family style eating. Every child will have their own portioned out food and we will throw away everything after the meal. All those things that will be in, in play. So physical distancing of, of all sorts. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that, you know, this requires since every classroom that is physically open also will have a remote learning component to it, we're, we're, we're using every available staff member because at the same time that a teacher is with children, there's another teacher with children remotely. And so, um, so everybody's doing the best they can to meet the needs of the kids that they're serving. And it'll be different in an infant room as it will be in a preschool room, where, it, which is what we saw, a preschool room with, with plexiglass. And in those settings that uh, you've been using, how do you sanitize the play equipment, the books, the uh, stuffed animals? How do you sanitize them? So no stuffed animals anymore, right? All soft, uh, porous materials have been removed. Every classroom has been, um, has been rearranged to eliminate any extra stuff. Um, as you might know, early childhood classrooms typically have a lot of stuff in them. Mm -hmm. These classrooms have been really uh, kind of pruned to only have materials they need. Every time a child uses a piece of uh, a material or a piece of equipment, it's put up for disinfecting. In typical terms, uh, in a typical classroom that uh, a child does 
does a puzzle and it gets put back on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Now the child does a puzzle and it gets put up for somebody else to come along and disinfect it. And we use, um, there, there are a couple of ways to disinfect. We have disinfecting chemical, uh, most you know, all child safe, of course. And uh, so, so things are sprayed, then they're air dried, which is the recommended approach. And then as they uh, dry, they're put back on the shelves. And so what teachers have had to do in every classroom that is open is prune the amount of stuff, but to make sure that there's enough stuff to be um, rotated in, as you might, is what I'll say. Great. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we have been joined also by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, who is a member of the Higher Education Committee. We want to make that acknowledgement. And if you have any questions, Council Member Cumbo, please indicate that and uh, the council will know that he can call on you at the appropriate time. Uh, for CUNY, was there any interaction between CUNY and its rec, the rec centers that the DOE established? No. So there Not were no. Aware. Okay. So there were no rec centers at CUNY. Uh, not that I'm aware of. No. Okay. And ha have you been involved at all with um, providing any type of? This is not really a question specifically for early development for early childhood, but have you been involved with the DOE in terms of considering what might be done to accelerate? Uh, those persons, those students who are in a teacher prep class, that they might in fact be able to accelerate their classes or the requirements so that they can in fact become teachers, even perhaps in a early childhood setting? Um, well, in community-based organizations, people who have not yet received their credentials can certainly work in early childhood settings and uh, they can work in those settings with study plans and another part of my office help students work on those study plans. And earlier in my testimony, I talked about a scholarship program that we funded at CUNY for uh, the early childhood workforce to expedite their credential and degree success. Um, also, we worked with the state of New York, the state education department to um, create, to extend certification for, for our graduates who had not yet passed the certification exams. So they got a grace period for a year um, so that they could begin their teaching as certified teachers while they were uh, using a grace period of a year to, to take their exams. And my office tutors people to prepare them to prepare for their exams and just pass them successfully. So my office and a number of other CUNY offices are very involved in trying to support student uh, students in, in early childhood and childhood ed to, uh, to work through the systems and get employment. In my office, early childhood is our biggest focus. We also, um, acknowledging that almost immediately the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in the city closed down the child care centers uh, at the onset of the pandemic, we created an employment network for, uh, for people who lost their work and for students who also lost their work to connect with other employers to try to make matches so that they could find work. We were most concerned about our students who need work to continue to to manage their studies. And so we have this employment network Great. that that has been working Thank fairly you. well. Uh, getting back to, to getting students to know, student parents to know that there are, there is some availability. For each of, you said each campus will have its own uh, policies that will follow the guidelines that you have been issued, that you have issued for them to be aware of. So as of Friday, September the 4th, um, we did not, the staff that did the research did not see that many of the campuses had in fact any updated information about their child care center. What is your role mm -hmm. from Central okay. in assisting campuses 
to get the information out. They have links to their centers, but uh, there's not information. There's have links to the college. The colleges have links, but there's no updated information. So what is your role mm -hmm. in assisting and having oversight to the campuses to help them understand that they've got to get it out? Yeah. So my role is to support the, the 17 campus programs. My role is to meet with them on a regular basis and to help them do the work they need to do. They are autonomous to a very large extent. They are private. Uh, the majority of the programs are private uh, 501c3s and they work independently. They function as small businesses. And my role is to bring them together to uh, help them consider best practices, help them be more successful in the way that they run their businesses and to support their uh, the way they meet the needs of each and every CUNY campus. In this particular moment, every campus, every college was given um, the responsibility of deciding how it would reopen and what that would mean. Would they, would they open their libraries? Would they open their campus child care centers? Would classes be in person or virtual or hybrid? Would they only have their lab students on campus and everybody else online. And so every single campus, and there are, as you know, better probably than I, there are 25 campuses, they have tremendous autonomy, and the chancellor honors that autonomy and gave them that choice. So each of our child care centers is working with their individual campus pro, uh, administration to make the best arrangements. And those arrangements in the last three weeks has shifted a little bit as we become more comfortable, as we understand what it would mean to include young children on a campus. And as you might imagine, there are some campuses who are still very worried about the health and welfare of small children coming to campus um, during a pandemic. And so each well, campus is managing this their own way. And uh, our guidance was meant as a floor. Like if you're going to reopen, these are the recommendations we're making. How many campuses have indicated that they are reopening? Um, at least between at least eight ha are reopened and more are considering a phased in opening. Are there um, any that indicate that they will not reopen, have definitively said that they will not reopen? Um, yes. Yes, we, you know why? and I think we provided you with a list so that you have it somewhere. I don't mean for you to look at it, but um, John Jay has not yet decided. Uh, I'm just looking at my uh, list here. Medgar uh, does not, I think is, has decided not to open. Brooklyn is considering how to manage because they have a state contract and, and then they have their other uh, enrollment. And so they're working on it. And do we know, you said some of them are questioning whether they will reopen. Yes. Uh, yeah. Others are phasing in. Do we know why Medgar is not reopening? Um, it it acknowledges that it may reopen for some of its pre-K children that are student parent that belong to student parents. But I think that Medgar felt that, uh, and I wanna be careful that I don't speak for them, but I think that they felt that it wasn't safe, that they were very worried about the amount of, um, of disease in Brooklyn and in that immediate community, as was Brooklyn College in the Flatbush area, there was tremendous illness. Mm -hmm. And and so I did speak. Um, I'll always respond if a campus administration wants to discuss their their reopening plans. And and we had a very a really viable conversation with Brooklyn, who expressed their concern about the number of families in their community that had been stricken, and their decision uh, initial decision was that they didn't want to have anybody on campus. Okay. And I suspect, again, I'm not speaking for Medgar, I have not talked to their campus administration, but 
but I suspect that their concern was simply around health and safety of children of student parents. Thank you. Now, in the, uh, in the spring semester where there were the campuses that did maintain uh, their services, and you said you were able to maintain the employees and you did not have to uh, dismiss any employees. Mm -hmm. What is your expectation going forward, starting with this semester in terms of employment? Yeah, great. So this is a month to month uh, issue for us. And it's driven by, so first let me say that the support that the city council has provided has helped stabilize this work in a dramatic fashion. The second layer of stabilization has come from the Office of Children and Family Services in that uh, they made a decision early in the pandemic that they would honor the enrollment numbers that were in effect back in March. And they have funded each of our programs based on that level of funding every month since the pandemic. That combination of funding has enabled teachers uh, to be remain employed, directors, every the staff to remain employed, and, and that has enabled them to do this one-on-one -on -one day, you know, regular family wellness checks and small group teaching, individualized teaching with children is, you know, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that a two-year-old or a three-year-old really can't be online by themselves and, uh, and needs help on both ends, both from a parent and a teacher on one end. And so there's a lot of individual, small group and mid-sized group instruction going on on a daily basis. And so that funding has allowed that to, to stay whole. And so that's- So you don't anticipate that there will be any layoffs of any of the employers, employees rather at the child development centers? I worry about it every single day. And, and Keisha has been extraordinary in keeping contact with the Office of Children and Family Services on a regular basis to ensure that we receive this uh, grace of funding every single month. And so we, as of uh, last week, know that September is funded and we hope that October will be funded. And that is how we have been uh, how the programs have been sustained each month by your steady funding and this monthly aff affirmation of funding that we've had since the day of the, the right. I think, I think, I think uh, Council Member Chair Rosenthal uh, has a great experience with those juggling and monthly allotments since a budget has not been approved and each level of government waiting for the level above them to come with some kind of uh, definitive statement. So we understand that that's a problem. Um, yeah. I don't know if Chair Rosenthal has further questions. I, I do, thank you very much. And I really appreciate the issues that you just got to Chair Barron and Dean Clary, your um, honest responses. I, I really appreciate that. And, you know, can tell you're juggling uh, a lot. So thank you. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the child care centers are have a plan um, for a possible second wave of COVID. They do. Um, we have been working on that through the summer. So for so one of the things that has happened in many of our most of our sites is that not only did we maintain an online presence but periodically the programs would send families activities and materials to work with at home we fully appreciate that not all of our families have a preschool classroom in their in their living rooms and so we've been uh, setting, sending things periodically. And um, what we've talked about and that what the staff have been doing is creating what we call go bags so that if a program was to have to reclose, that on that day, children would leave the site with a bag of things. So Got it. we great. are really worried 
you know, we never have the luxury, and I'll call it that, to talk about the social emotional impact of this craziness, this madness on small children. They, um, you know, they experience their parents' stress, but they don't understand it. They, they yeah. have their own stress because they used to come to school every day or every three, you know, every other day, and now they don't. They, uh, they used to have a grandma and either they don't have one anymore or they just can't see her anymore. Uh, and not everybody is so great with, you know, with, uh, you know, FaceTime and, and there are, you know, not every grandma is great with FaceTime. And so there are all these things. And so what the campus childcare staff have been committed to, I would call it dedicated to, is somehow keeping a real lifeline of social emotional connection to these children. And so if it's way, you know, you could go online and download somebody reading a story, but it's way, way better if the teacher you know is reading you that story. And so yeah. teachers have videotaped themselves reading stories. They have videotaped themselves doing, you know, exercises and songs so that a parent oh, can wow. put that on. And so these go bags are a part of that. Like what would happen if we end up with a second wave and we have to shut down again? How are we going to stay connected to these children and help them <laughs> manage that? So go bags, mailing things. Um, you know, CUNY has been extraordinary in that while nobody, you know, it feels like nobody's on campus. If we have to do a mailing, you can contact the mailroom on campus and you can, and they'll help with that. So we've done some of that kind of thing. Okay. A few programs are member are participants of Quality Stars New York, and they have had additional supports to get things out into the community, into, into the homes. Makes um, sense. So makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then Again, this is a tricky issue when it comes to fees, but also, you know, what are you charging students, but also having enough money to keep your teachers employed and the child care centers open. Um, I'm wondering, uh, if, if someone chooses to send their child or have their child be at child care remotely, is there a discount of some sort? It's my understanding that most of the programs are not charging for remote learning. Oh, wow. And, and I think I think it's, and it's, a, of course, a decision by uh, the campus by campus. Um, I think the mindset there was that these are families that are already experiencing extraordinary oh. hardship. And that that uh, if they could avoid. Now, I think you probably know that some of our families pay less, you know, they pay $5 a week in, in regular circumstances. Sure. In some programs, $5 a day. But but most of our programs have, I forgot to mention that they also have, C, many of them have C-Campus grants. Those are federal dollars. That money has also remained intact. Okay. So the programs have been a lot, have been able to hold themselves whole, uh, you know, they've, some of them have lost staff just because they've staff have decided they just can't work in the, during these moments. But for the most part, the staffs are intact and they are covered by these different funding levels. And, and if a program was able to not charge families, they have, they have not charged families. And just last week, we had a conversation about you know, how people came to those decisions. And obviously it's based on the simple fact that these student parents are experiencing incredible hardship. Do you have a sense of how many have had to drop out of school because of juggling coronavirus and childcare? I don't have a number, but what I can tell you is enrollments at several of our campuses were up over the summer and up in the fall, some are down. Some enrollments are down. And I can say, although it was a very small sample, considering how large CUNY is, uh, earlier in my testimony, when I talked about this project that we launched a full, full scale in January with, in, the, in that semester for 100 people, we only lost one student. So 1% in a very targeted population. Now, I'm sure that that is not indicative of CUNY's population, 
And we can surely try to find that out. But in the student parent world in, at, the, at the campus child care centers, one of their direct charges is to not let go of people. And, and so um, we don't have data for this past semester, but, but data across, across the country about the campus child care center's ability to retain students in typical times can be as high as 94%. And there isn't another place on campus that can boast that kind of retention rate. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our goal with our directors is to make sure that they fully appreciate how their role in helping keep people in. And so of course, in the regular wellness checks, one of the questions is often, are you able to continue to ma you know, manage your studies? Do you need help? Do you have a laptop? Do you have a laptop with, with uh, Wi-Fi? You know, many students maybe, maybe do most of their online work in a library. And when the library is closed and then the campus yeah. library is closed, we became very, very worried about who had, you know, internet. And so all those questions come into play when the campus child care centers are doing their job. Okay. And last question, because I know we have parents waiting to testify. Um, I'm wondering, has the university made a decision about student activity fees? whether or not to waive them this year, given that there are very few student activities, but also my concern too, is that I know some of the childcare money comes from those fees. Right, so I don't know um, what the campuses have decided and uh, we can, Keisha and I can certainly try to find out and get that back to you. Is that going to be made college by college or by the university? Well, I by suspect it's a, a central office decision. Yeah. Okay. And we'll, we'll find out. Okay. But thank you very much. That is. My pleasure. Sure, Baron, thank you for the courtesy. Appreciate it. Uh, more than welcome. More than welcome. Just one final question. The DOE has um, protocols in place for determining if a student should be sent home uh, because they may be exhibiting COVID-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. And they also have protocols that say, if one child is sick uh, for 14 days, those students and staff in that classroom have to be quarantined. And if two children mm -hmm. in different classes are sick, the whole building is supposed to shut down. What are the protocols regarding um, children who may be exhibiting symptoms of having COVID? Sure. So um, per the video, children are assessed before they even come in the building and the night before their parents really have to ascertain that their child has no symptoms. Then they come to the building and they again are assessed for symptoms. Right. If they have no symptoms, they're able to come. As we all know, a child can, can create, can develop symptoms in a, in a matter of an hour or so. And so if yeah. they exhibit symptoms, they're sent home. And yes, they can't come back until they're symptom free free for 14 days, uh, depending on where the child was, when they had symptoms, the program would make a decision whether to close the classroom, close the center, it would depend. Um, but though I, I think all of those uh, kind of guidelines come from the CDC and from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the State Department of Health. And the programs, the centers are, uh, are required to abide by those uh, guidelines and requirements. Thank so you. Would be similar. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Senegal, are there any members who have questions? If not, this panel can be excused and we want to thank you so much for your testimony. You're welcome. Thank you, thank Chair you. Barron. If there's any council members who have a question, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. There being no raised hands, we've concluded testimony for this panel. Thank you. Is the council now going to begin to call uh, the public for their testimony? Yes. Um, so now that we've concluded the administration's testimony, we will now turn to public testimony. 
Um, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I've called on your name to testify. Um, once your name is called, uh, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant will give you the go ahead to begin. Um, your testimony will be limited to five minutes. Um, wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before you start your testimony. So the next panel, um, which is uh, apparently our last panel, will be in order of speaking, Giovanni Picant, CUNY University Student Senate, and Amber Rivero, President, John Jay College Student Council. Giovanni, uh, you may begin your testimony when the sergeant tells you it's okay to begin. Your time begins now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Council Member. I good, morning. good morning, Council Member Helen Rosenthal. I would just like to say thank you uh, for setting up this panel and this hearing for us. We've been waiting. We are anxious. Um, it's been a long year um, in a pandemic, but we started the school year strong. And uh, I just want to say thank you for giving the opportunity for us to share our concerns. Um, I wrote, before I want to address um, anything, my remarks that I want to say, I think I just want to thank Councilmember Rosenthal and I as Councilmember Barron for asking these tough questions, because I do believe there needs to be more communication with the student leaders um, at CUNY. As we were on this panel, I checked in with the student trustee, Timothy Hunter, in regards to ask him if he knew about the student parent task force at CUNY, and he didn't know about it. And as student leaders, we would like to know which student parents are on this task force. This is a student trustee. He's a member of the Board of Trustees. It's alarming that he does not even know that this task force is going on. Um, and my colleague, Amber Rivera, she's also a par parent. So she will be talking as well about um, this issue. But we are calling for more communication with student leaders because we are the ones who disseminate that information to our students. And we have been hearing a lot of concerns about childcare. But, I just wanted to talk um, here today to dis discuss why we're here. And there's a lot of racial injustice and uproar that is going on in our nation, in our institution, um, that goes into our gender equity issues and how do we see equality and justice for our students. Um, and when we talk about funding for higher education, I think when we talk about more resources for mental health, uh, a more inclusive openingness for our trans students on our campuses. Menstrual equity is a huge issue. We met with Council Member Rosenthal many times last year to try to get pilot programs on our campuses, but we do feel as if our administration should be taking a more robust approach in regards to that on our campuses. We're calling on CUNY to provide more gender neutral bathrooms on our campuses, more gender neutral focused policies, more gender neutral focused services for our students, therapy for our students, counseling for our students. Many students may feel as if they don't know where to go. They don't know which resources to go. And I, when council member Inez Barron brings up our centralized marketing, that is a really big portion. CUNY, the federal government has changed the Title IX policies and CUNY has worked with us and we were part of those conversations. But I do think a centralized marketing in regards to other students who will go beyond the student leaders and CUNY are very important for us to be had because it's not, it's going to be the students who will become disenfranchised of these services. Despite being in a pandemic, students are still going through a lot at home and we need to ensure that there are services and they know where to go. Another thing I would like to um, touch on is the support services. Support services during COVID-19 is a huge, huge issue within our institution as of right now. Many students, are saying that being at home, they understand the pandemic, but what can we do? How can we help? Students need places to study. Students need services. Food insecurity is still a major issue. Currently at my local student government, on my local campus at City Tech, we are figuring out a way to get food to students on our campuses. Our administration has been stalling. We have been trying to put this together ever since last year. Timothy Hunter was the SGA president there. We have pressed them. When we had our first hearing last year with Toby Ann Stavitsky, Senate of the Higher Education Committee chair, and we at Broken College, we discussed that food insecurity was a huge issue. And that has not been resolved. It is up to our SGA now for us to figure out 
Who's going to help us get the food on campus? How are we going to disseminate that? It is all reliant on the student government on that campus. And I quite frankly don't think that is right. I think that we need more involvement with administration. I think there needs to be oversight with our CUNY administration to understand the services that students have, student services that are ha having on each campus. Every campus is different and we need to understand and ensure that each student from each campus is receiving the same services and qualities or let's try to do at least a due diligence. Let's try to, like council member said, Ines Barron said, a centralized marketing tactic for us to ensure students know that these services are there. Because as we speak right now, I'm hearing a lot of things about the child care centers, the task force, I took some notes. Many students don't know about these things and they are concerned and they are going through a lot. And I would say this, the students who are student parents, juggling class and also juggling a student at home and I'm trying smart. to get services from campuses is extremely tough. And I yield over to my colleague, Amber Rivero. Giovanni, if you have more, you could, uh, Chair Barron, if it's all right with yes. you, yeah, yes. you should continue, yes. and we're going to be asking you questions as well, but if you have more of your testimony you'd like to share, please continue. Yeah, and thank you for that, and, and also I would really like to um, talk about our state of higher education. We know the pandemic is in place, we know the semester has started, but we have not heard notice on this tuition hike this mental health and wellness fee. It is extremely alarming with the lack of announcement or lack of notice for students. We are now about to be soon near to be a month within the semester. And students deserve to know if the price of their education will be rising on left field. Many students had intentions of enrolling into the semester with a certain price in mind, and that can instantly hike. And that is extremely, extremely alarming, being that a lot of students are dealing with housing and food insecurity. And my colleague and I, and we share the same sentiments at U University Student Senate, we are really calling on oversight with CUNY to understand the support services, to understand the state of the students that they're in. Because many students have enrolled in classes at CUNY for this semester, but many students do not know how they're going to get through those classes. And it is really reliant on the student government to get students together to understand these support services. And I must admit, we are very overwhelmed. We are dealing with school, but we are also trying to keep things afloat and be the best leaders that we can be for our students. And we need our local campus administrations to step it up extremely need them to be a part of these conversations and include them in us in these conversations. Because I don't think it's fair that I'm hearing at a city council hearing that we have a task force um, for student parents and the trustee has never heard of it. University Student Senate has never heard of it. SGA presidents have never heard of it. And we have student parents who are student leaders. We have student parents and our student governments in our institutions. And I really, really encourage that conversation be had and there's some oversight there. And I yield my time to Amber Rivero. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Ms. Rivero, you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Barron and Chair Rosenthal um, and all of the committee members and council members that are here today. Thank you for allowing us to come and testify. Um, my name is Amber Rivero. I'm a parent and also a CUNY student. I'm also a proud alumni of Mega Evers College in Central Brooklyn, and I'm now a senior at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and serving as president of our student government for the college, representing about 15,000 undergraduate students within CUNY and graduate students, sorry. Um, a lot of what I'm going to share right now actually testifies to the experience pre-COVID, so I can't really attest to what's happening for parents during COVID with child care centers, but I'm going to focus on concerns that I have before COVID. As a parent, I can attest to how helpful child care can be for a student to be successful during their college journey. However, at John Jay's campus, the lack of staffing and the lack of funding, allegedly, for the John Jay's Child Care Center has led to it being very minimal in the services that they can provide students. So many students in our CUNY EDGE program, which is connected to HRA, are often single parents and young parents. There's a high rate of lack of participation in extracurriculars for students in this program. And I often see them having to take their children to appointments for all of their administrative and academic needs at the college, which can be really tough and distracting. There's also a low amount of space every single semester 
for students to participate in the child care center services with their children, as most of the children being cared for are from college staff. A certain amount of funding for the child care centers, I am told, comes from student activity fees as well. I'm asking that the Committee on Higher Ed consider ways to either provide more funding and support for CUNY campus child care centers, or that a policy or task force similar to this oversight committee from city council be charged with specific oversight on the child care centers to make sure that the public funds and student activity fees are being used to serve the students and not just CUNY employees. I would love to actually know how many of those 1,750 child care slots that were mentioned earlier in the Dean's testimony are actually serving students' children at CUNY. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming and offering your testimony. And uh, Giovanni, once again, good to see you. And you talked about food insecurity. And we know that that is a very important issue. And we do want to acknowledge, I don't have the dollar amount in front of me, but there was an initiative which the speaker funded from the speaker's pot, which provided money for uh, the, the pantries at each of the uh, each of the CUNY campuses. So we don't know what that will be this year, but we certainly appreciate and recognize that it was much needed in terms of addressing the needs of hunger. People like to fancy it up and say food insecurity. It's hunger. It's an issue and it's a disgrace that in this country that exists, but it is in fact an issue that we have to address. So we're hoping that we'll be able to look at how that can be addressed and whether there's any opportunity for any of this federal stimulus money that has come or is coming further to be addressed for that issue, to be uh, directed to that issue, both for food and for childcare services. And you did raise a very important question. You said that there are not enough spots and oftentimes the uh, faculty and staff have their children in spots that are allocated at these campuses. And we will in fact include that as a follow-up question to CUNY because I have always been told, we didn't raise the question this year, this hearing rather, but we have in previous hearings and we've been told that first priority is for students. So what we can do now is to request documentation, request the data that gives us the disaggregated um, uh, attendance or uh, enrollment for students, for faculty, for staff, and for community. Because it's always been said that priority goes to students first. And we wanna make sure that we get the numbers that validate that. And in terms of um, your pursuit of a degree, I want to encourage you, glad to know that you're at the senior college now. So did you go, uh, Amber, did you go to Mega for an associates or did you just after a period of time transfer from Mega to John Jay? Yes, I actually got my associate's degree in public administration and then I transferred to John Jay to pursue my bachelor's. Okay, good. So we'll have um, our council follow up that question to CUNY admin to the central and I'll turn it over now to Council Member Rosenthal, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Barron. And, you know, uh, I really do want to give a shout out to Dean Clary for staying on with us and hearing yes. from the students yourself. Um, I'm not sure it's protocol, but if you would like to answer um, Chair Barron's question uh, now about priority and numbers. If you have the data or if you'll need to get back to us on that, um, I think that's really important. I don't know if the if the sergeants can unmute Dean Clary. There we go. Thank you. Um, so I've asked Keisha to look up the numbers as soon as Amber said that because each and every campus child care center takes the great majority of its enrollment as students and so I think that the data uh, will bear out, but I don't have it in front of me and Keisha's working on it. So if we get it before we end, I'll share it. Otherwise we'll, we'll certainly share it. 
The other thing I would like to say is that the task force is brand new, has not yet met. And Amber, if you email me, I would love to talk to you a little bit about it. And so my email is a CUNY email, sherry.cleary at cuny.edu. And um, we are we will spend the, the next week thinking about which students now that the semester is back up and running, we will be, we have a, a student, we'll be adding considerably more students to the group. So if you haven't missed a thing, we're starting, we're just starting the actual meetings. And um, and and maybe you'll uh, maybe we'll arrange for you to serve. So I don't want to put any pressure, but um, we're we're looking for student participants. So you're absolutely right, Giovanni, that there should be students on this group, uh, and there and there will be. Uh, so as I said, we've already uh, recruited uh, students, but we are meeting next week to to strategize how to make you know you can't get a representative group at a place as large as cuny so we have to be really thoughtful about how do we uh involve students at several different levels one on the task force and then how do we reach out and get information from them so you're both both of you are on the money and and amber i welcome you and also you giovanni to feel free to reach out to me i'm a pretty good responder and um, and so we'll try to get the numbers for you, um, and I'll and I'll I'll just get, I don't want to hold you up, so we'll get back to you. Great, thank you, Dean Cleary, and and sort of addressing this right on the spot. Um, Giovanni, you know, is on the student senate. I mean, both are, but so she can you know make sure that Timothy Hunter is involved, um, given that he's a trustee and really appreciate your openness um, to this right on the spot. That's great. Um, and, and to both uh, students, um, Giovanni and Amber, I mean, your leadership here is extraordinary. I can't believe how you're able to do your classes and be such great leaders um, for your school, for the students. Um, in communicating what you are seeing, what you are experiencing up, up the ladder. That's so critical and you should both know you do it extremely well. Um, the other CUNY students are, are really lucky to have you. Um, I wanted to ask, actually Amber, but I get the feeling uh, because I knew uh, sometimes you have to jump away for a second. But um, Amber, if you're still around, but Jumani, maybe you can take a stab at this as well. Just sort of your sense from knowing your friends who are student um, parents, do you get a sense of how the lack of childcare um, affects your friends and whether or not you know people who have had to uh, step away from college for a while because they did not have childcare options. Well, I um, I don't I don't know anybody specifically, but I met this one girl um, during my time at University of Houston a couple months ago. She did have to take some steps back from her college experience at your college due to childcare and a lack of financial hardships and just many things overall. And I do have a colleague in my own personal student government and we were, she's so passionate about getting this food um, pantry rolled out on campus because she expresses how sometimes she doesn't eat to ensure that her daughter eats. Um, there's some times that she doesn't know where she's gonna get food. And when we were on campus, we did have some money from the Peachy Grant that gave us vouchers and we were, be, we were able to go across the street to get some food from the market or from our cafeteria. Being that the campus is closed and this is exactly what we were afraid of, last year we were pressing our administration. Um, if we had a food pantry, distributions, no contact distributions could have been done. There are campuses I know are doing it right now. You request it online. I believe BMCC has a great mechanism of doing that. Students can request online exactly what non-perishable items they would like. And then they set up an appointment to pick it up to make sure that social distancing is in place, everything is in order, and there's a schedule. 
And I think that on my campus, the lack of urgency of creating a food pantry, as you mentioned, there was money to go to a food pantry. There is no physical pantry. If you all go visit my campus as of right now, there's nothing the administration can tell you, but there's evidence that the students have been pushing for this for months, way before the pandemic has came. And now we are still meeting with local or community organizations to figure out how we are going to get food on campus. And I would assure you and say that parents, they're going through a lot. They are very stressed. They don't know what's, when's gonna be their next meal. They know they have to get through these classes and the lack of support, I feel like is slowly deteriorating and deteriorating that, you know, their motivation and their urgency, you know, to continue college. And it, we feel so helpless because simple things such as hunger should not be an issue at an institution where we have leaders who go on TV and say, CUNY is this, these students go for free and we have a food pantry. And the reality is that it's not. Our college president was aware that there wasn't a food pantry because after the student trustee mentioned that at a hearing, he spoke to him. And it is now September 10th, 2020. We have still not have a food pantry. Mm. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, Amber, we have another yeah. us. Hi. Hi, sorry. My children were actually acting up in the background while you guys were asking that question, so. Hi. That's you fun. just you you just improved this hearing hi. by a million percent. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. hi. <laughs> We're so happy you're here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, um, I just want to say that um, the city council. We just want to acknowledge that last year the speaker did fund uh, an initiative for food pantries. And that was $1 million. And that is again uh, available and has been put into the budget for this year for a million dollars. We want to acknowledge that happening. And we certainly want to see what Central can do to assist those campuses that do not have a food pantry, particularly in this time of the pandemic and people uh, really being challenged, people having lost jobs and being very restricted in their budget. So we want to ask CUNY Central what they can do to assist those campuses. As I, I've heard it, they're autonomous. There are perhaps uh, certain things that they're not required to do. But I would think that during this time, we need to assist any campus that has a genuine interest in establishing a food pantry and doing that. Nice. Um, and just as a quick follow up to that, um, Giovanni, you might want to do a little research on the free um, free freezers. This is a new thing where people are setting out refrigerators and the community is, is packing them with food and they're popping up throughout the city. Um, Amber, while we have you, because I know it's, uh, you're always juggling things as a parent, um, could I ask you, uh, is there, uh, from your experience, what were the biggest issues in terms of getting childcare at CUNY? And is there anything CUNY could do to alleviate those concerns? Um, are there any that we haven't, have not mentioned today that, that CUNY Central could address? Um, I think, like I mentioned, the CUNY EDGE program is actually HRA recipients. Um, and, you know, a lot of those students um, are single parents or young parents. And so um, our child care center at John Jay, you're not allowed to like do drop-ins and you're not, and, and like you have to, if you, if your child is enrolled in the child care center, you have to like give them your class schedule and then you have literally five minutes to pick them up after class ends. So there's no extra grace period to go to like, financial aid or to an advisement or even to like a career workshop to get your resume worked on in case you're trying to apply for a job. Um, and so I I've tried within the college to kind of push back on that and ask why there's not a little bit more time allotted because it is very difficult to like talk to your advisor and plan for your future or find out what's going on with your bursar hold while your child is kind of like you know, not busy um, and, and doesn't really understand what you're, what you're doing. Um, and I think that just even like giving that extra support, right? Um, if you're paying for childcare services, why do you have to immediately pick your child up five minutes after class? 
I don't think that the faculty and staff are being required to do that after their work hours. And I don't know if that's only John Jay specific. I haven't talked to other childcare centers, but I know when I was at Megar Evers that um, I think it was maybe like $5, $10 a week for parents. Um, it was really affordable and um, it was just a lot better policy structure for parents and staff. And I never heard of anyone complaining about how the child care center wasn't conducive for parents to be able to go to school at Megar Evers, whereas John Jay is a larger community. And yet um, I personally have never been able to send my child there. Um, so I drop him off in Brooklyn and then I travel an hour or two from South Brooklyn to Manhattan. Um, and then I have to rush back after classes or student government, right, and pick him up. And it would have been nice if I would have been able to utilize it, but how many other parents, you know, just really need an hour to study or time to go to the library for exams and don't even have that space. Why are they paying for childcare and it's not the same childcare that would be offered at a private daycare or a regular pre-K? I don't know again if that's only John Jay specific, but that was my personal take or struggles with it. That is very helpful. Wow, mute just at the perfect time. Um, I saw Dean Cleary taking notes and I'm sure she's gonna follow up about that. Um, that is a critical insight where the center is not meeting your needs. It thinks it is because it's got you covered while you're in class. But the truth of the matter is as a student, you have many other things you need to spend time on. So if they really want to give you comprehensive help, they need to be able to stretch that window. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, you know, I do just wanna mention that the task force, it, it sounds like it's critical. Uh, it's, it's great that it's starting, it's too bad it didn't start a long time ago. Um, but I really hope that an agenda item, a very important agenda item will be letting students know what is happening. Um, you know, we hear regularly of the problem of communication between the school administration and students and student leaders, um, whether it be childcare or last year, you know, even shutting the school down and, and kids being told they had to evacuate their rooms in, you know, less than 24 hours. Um, communication is always the key um, to implementing any program successfully. And I really hope there'll be time devoted to the issue of messaging, you know, what is the message? What is the message at which campuses how do we cover every base, you know, snail mail, email, social media, to make sure that bulletin boards, to make sure that the student parents know what's available for them. Um, you know, it's often the, the easiest thing, communication, but yet it's the last thing so that anyone thinks about. So you may be making some brilliant decisions in the task force, but they don't really have any value if the information doesn't get to all of the students. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I think I'm about to wrap up. Chair Barron, you know, certainly the floor is yours, but to the students, if there's anything you would, that we haven't covered that you would like to talk about a little bit more you should feel free. Uh, I think we covered everything so far. One thing I'll make it our business to do is follow up with you all to let you know the status. I think we have some verbal commitments on engaging students in this process and we'll be sure to update city council maybe monthly on how we think communication and childcare is going from the student perspective. I think it's gonna be very conducive uh, because I've been, you know, doing this student advocacy stuff for a year, and I, I truly feel like this is the year we need to get things done, actually. And uh, I look forward to working, to sitting on the child care um, student parent task force along with Amber Rivero, and we will rally up the students. We have no students who will 
gladly be able to provide their input and their experiences from many various backgrounds. We can be sure to get you a good handful of students. Uh, Amber just reached out to me. She said she had to leave. She was late for a meeting, but she says thank sure. you. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you for passing that along. Um, I know that I've asked you this question before, but when are you running for office? <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> when, you know, when, you have me there. I, I'm ready to engage in your campaign. <laughs> when I when I when I make sure the academics are in order and we get the degrees that we need to get, we do what we need to do. Then we can think of next things. But all right. As Leader, I'm a student first and we still have homework and classes to go to. So that's fair, important. fair, good point. But just remember, you have my cell. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm there for you. Thank you, Councilman Rosenbaum. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chair Rosenthal. Uh, and, and I echo the comments of my colleague. And as, as Giovanni, as you talk about, this is a time to make a change. You referenced earlier, I believe in your testimony that the, this country has been a model of so many injustices and inequities. And people oftentimes hear the phrase, we're all in this together. And to that, I say, yes, but we're not all in the same kind of boats. Some of us are in ocean liners, some of us are in yachts, some are in sailboats or rowboats, and some of us only have life jackets. So what we've got to do is use this opportunity to make sure that as we go through this storm and as we come out at the other end, that there is the equity that does not exist now. We've got to raise our voices and share our ideas about how to make that happen. And it's not just in education, but in all of the dynamics and all of the social institutions and corporate institutions and economic systems that exist as well. And I did find some references for uh, some, one of the uh, news programs had links for organizations that address the issue of hunger. I think the program was Hunger in America. And there are three websites that I'd like to share. One is for everyone, eligible for everyone, and it's called feedingamerica.org, feedingamerica.org. Another website is targeted specifically for children and its website is nokidhungry.org, nokidhungry.org. And there is a separate site for veterans, and that site is feedourvets.org, feedourvets.org. So hopefully that will be of assistance as well. And at this point, if there are no further formalities that have to be conducted, we would just like to ask if there's any council members who have questions. Thank you. The uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function if so. And seeing none, uh, it appears that we've concluded public testimony for today. Thank you. Having said so, I will now adjourn this hearing. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal, for your.